I'm not really, as you heard uh, from John's introduction, a climate change expert. But maybe, um, you know, when listening to the debate this afternoon, there is a certain need for demystification. A bit like what we did on human rights in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, there is probably a need, an urgent need, to demystify um, um, climate change. So since I'm not a, an expert, uh, what, a lot of what I'm going to say is probably, sounds probably pretty simplistic. Um, but maybe that contributes to demystification. So we have heard a lot uh, this week uh, about the future. Uh, future demographies uh, will kind of oblige us to produce 70% uh, more food with less resources. Um, so here's a business opportunity for the world's biggest food company. Um, but 70% more food with less resources, as uh, Professor uh, uh, Jon Rockström put it this morning in the laureate's uh, seminar. Um, water resources, there's probably not going to be more fresh water around to be used uh, for future agricultural production. We have reached the peak uh, uh, of renewable water uh, resources. Arable land, not more. Uh, arable land available, really. We've probably sort of reached the maximum. So we have to do, uh, we have really uh, to produce more with less. Um, what we uh, at Nestle uh, are, are trying to do, we are, as I said, world's biggest food and beverage company, uh, 470 factories, half of those factories in developing countries, and about half of those in rural areas, uh, with sourcing districts that go uh, with them. Uh, 330,000 employees. And uh, a fundamental principle, uh, which is that uh, creating value for the business, which is uh, clear, we've been around for more than 140 years and we want to be around for another 140 years. Um, at the same time, we want to create value for society. Um, through uh, three focus areas, water, nutrition, and rural development. Keeping in mind that the, fun the foundation uh, um, of this shared value creation uh, is compliance and sustainability. Um, and we want to do this uh, along our entire value chain. Uh, today we focus, I'll focus only uh, on our direct operations very briefly and then uh, on the agricultural um, uh, upstream uh, supply chain. Direct operations uh, mitigation uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, you see the, the, the curve at the top, the black curve, is uh, our production, which increased by 73% uh, over uh, the last 10 years. So 73% uh, higher uh, production. And uh, at the same time, uh, we have managed uh, to keep the total on-site energy consumption uh, at the same level. Um, Waste uh, for disposal has gone down. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions have gone down by 17%. Uh, water withdrawals by 28%. And finally, treated uh, wastewater uh, discharge. So discharge of treated wastewater has gone down by uh, 38%. All this, while at the same time, increasing production by 73%. Uh, but this is not where the challenge is. Um, we have uh, had challenges. Uh, uh, also adaptation challenges in some of our factories. Um, on the mitigation side, uh, we, uh, we use uh, coffee grinds to uh, power our coffee factories. Almost all of our coffee factories' uh, fossil fuels are uh, at 50% or higher replaced by the coffee grinds which uh, come out of the production process to power the factories. We had to adapt milk factories in water-scarce areas by reutilizing uh, the milk, uh, re reutilizing the water uh, uh, which is contained in the milk. But this is not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge, as we heard from Ulrike, uh, is in agriculture. So we work uh, globally with, uh, it's now uh, more than 650,000 farmers. We don't own any farms, but we work directly with the farmers. And we have um, about 20,000 experts uh, who uh, work with those farmers. Yet a bigger challenge. So these are the farmers we work directly with. A yet bigger challenge is the further upstream uh, agricultural supply chain. Uh, more than five million farmers uh, from whom we source uh, indirectly. We have a number of programs uh, uh, on this. We have water guidelines uh, for suppliers of agricultural raw materials. Uh, and I'll just give you two examples on, on what we do. 
irrigation. Uh, this is not an example from Sub-Saharan Africa, it's an example from Italy. Uh, challenge there, um, uh, water table going down, soil fertility going down, uh, high temperature going up, um, and then high water and energy costs. So uh, drip irrigation uh, with a soil powered uh, system, including uh, fertilizers, uh, um, uh, lead to higher yields. Uh, and, of course, a strong reduction of uh, water use. Payback of this investment, one to two years. So, uh, interesting. Uh, another example, uh, completely different, in, the, uh, in our milk districts in Latin America. Similar challenge, uh, higher temperature, uh, um, deforestation, uh, yields go down. If it's too hot, uh, cows produce less, less milk. So uh, silver pasture is, is quite a simple traditional method of instead of having just grass, having grass, bushes and trees. The trees provide shade uh, for the cows, temperature goes down, uh, productivity goes up, and uh, the, the bush, the shrubs, uh, and also the trees which the, cow, the cow, cows eat, the leaves, um, provide higher uh, fat and, and, and protein content in the milk. So it's a, a, an, an, an absolute win-win. Um, the productivity goes up 38%. Uh, uh, you can have more cows uh, per hectare, and at the same time, uh, you uh, protect the soil, groundwater preservation, biodiversity, and it's an additional uh, source of income because some of these trees are actually fruit trees, uh, which can then be, where the fruit can then be sold. So, what we should not forget, however, um, I showed you a couple of examples on, 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 uh, uh, on agriculture. Um, I have a colleague who is actually is a specialist in uh, climate change, and he said, look, at the end of the day, um, climate change adaptation in agriculture is just about good agricultural practices. But when we talk about good, uh, good, talking about good agricultural practices is one thing, but then what we should not forget is the waste, and it's post-harvest losses, and it's the waste on the consumer side. Post-harvest losses, if you only look at milk, we've managed to uh, reduce uh, the milk losses in our milk districts uh, from 25 to less than 1% uh, over the last, uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 to 20 years. This is the equivalent to 815 to 1 point, uh, 1,375 million cubic meters of water savings. This is the equivalent of five to eight times the total water uh, withdrawals of the entire Nestle company with all our factories uh, and all our infrastructure. So there is a gigantic potential uh, uh, there uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the milk supply chain. And then on the consumer side, maybe you want to think of these figures next time you open your fridge and you look at uh, throwing away uh, the milk which Maybe the do-by date uh, uh, says something, uh, uh, but maybe you could still drink it. So maybe you should first smell if it's still uh, drinkable. So I leave you with that for the royal banquet. Thank you very much. Thank you.